God bless each of you that are on the line and those of you tonight that are on Facebook Live. This is Prayer Changes Things Ministries with the host, Pastor, Pastor Lois Antoine, and your teacher, Apostle L.A. Anderson. Tonight, we're on a very important subject that we ask each of you to get your Bibles, pen and pencils, and paper that you might be able to record the lesson tonight in order for you to go back over it again and again. We're coming tonight from the scripture, the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, with verse 10. And we're going to read in your hearing tonight the full armor of God and how you can be caught up in deception if you're not involved in the word of the living God. The Bible says this, and this is in the Amplified Bible, the armor of God. In conclusion, be strong in the Lord. Draw your strength from him and be empowered through your union with him. And in the power of his boundless might, put on the full armor of God, for his precepts are like the splendor armor of a heavily armed soldier, so that you may be able to successfully stand up against the schemes and the strategies and the deceits of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against spiritual rulers, against powers, against the world of forces of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural places. Therefore, put on the complete armor of God so that you will be able to successfully resist and stand your ground in the evil day of danger. And having done everything that the crisis demand, to stand firm in your place, fully prepared, immovable, victorious. So stand firm and hold your ground, having tightened the wide band of truth, personal integrity, moral courage around your waist, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and upright heart, and having strapped on your feet, my God, the gospel of peace in preparation to face the enemy with firm-footed stability, the readiness produced by the good news. Above all, lift up the protective shield of faith, which will bring and extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, Pray with specific requests at all times, on every occasion, and in every season, in the Spirit, and with this in view, stay alert with all perseverance and petitions, interceding in prayer for God's people. I need you to understand today that we are in the midst of of spiritual deception oh, yes. in the yes. midst of our churches worldwide. And tonight we need to understand how important it is for us to understand and know when spiritual deception is in our midst. Mm. So tonight I want you to know that we're dealing with spiritual and physical signs of deception. And you need to ask the question, what are these signs of deception? First of all, I need to ask a question. Are you growing up in Christ at the church you attend? Or is it a praise party and entertainment? All right now. Are you taught that this is a spiritual battle, not a physical one? Found in 2 Corinthians 10 and 4. How do you know when a wolf is in the pulpit? Mm. Matthew 7, 15 through 16. Is the gospel of good news or another gospel you are hearing? Death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know what deception really is? Can you spot a fake teacher or a fake preacher? What is the flavor of your church when it comes to praise and worship? Right. How does your pastor and leaders dress 
worldly or church clothes or robes. Here are some signs that you are being deceived. First of all, their speech pattern in regular speech, such as not saying enough or too much, or an unusual change in vocal tones. Gestures, non congruent gestures, such as mismatching words and body language. Eye contact, lack of eye contact, or avoiding eye contact. Behavior, unusual, inappropriate, or uncommon behavior, such as excessive fidgeting or defensive reactions. Five, emotion, strange emotions, such as laughing when the subject is serious. Mm -hmm. Listen to me tonight. This is very important for you to grasp and hold on to. Deception can also include inconsistent stories, withholding information, or statements that misrepresent or distort facts, especially from the Bible standpoint. Mm. Finally, deception involves lying. Let me say that again. Deception involves lying, distorting the facts, making up stories, hiding the real truth, or misleading someone in some way. It can be harmful to your mind and your heart because it violates trust for the real article, which is the total word of God as found from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, 66 books that God wrote to lead us into eternal life. So tonight we ask the question, how do you detect deception? Let me say that again. How do you detect deception? Which for inappropriate, unusual, or uncommon behavior, you should know when it's a lie and not God's word, chapter and verse. Can you be easily fooled? What is the best indicator of deception? As a child of God, you should know God's word, Old and New Testament, and become an investigator of biblical truth. So you should watch for words such as think, guess, sort of, maybe, might, perhaps, approximately, about, or could be. Remember vague statements and expressions of uncertainty. Allow for a deceptive preacher or a false prophet lead way to modify his or her assertions at a later date without directly contradicting the original statement from the start. A lie is still a lie. Amen. Here are the best warning signs that reveal deceptive persons. First of all, they speak in absolutes such as always and never. They brag by downplaying their accomplishments. Mm -hmm. They try to please you by judging people you both may know and have learned about. They are highly defensive in their language. They love to debate and trap your opinion. They talk too much but say too little about the facts of Scripture as found in both the Old and New Testament. Listen to me tonight. Make sure they are not lying, stating something known to be untrue with the intent to deceive. Mm -hmm. I need to ask you the question, can you tell by knowing the word of God for yourself? And one of the most common forms of deception is self-deception. Let me say that again. One of the most common forms of deception is self-deception, which usually is done to bolster self-confidence or to avoid an uncomfortable situation. Mm -hmm. I need to ask you tonight, is that you? Do you carry a Bible with you to church? And do you know what the difference is between the Old and New Testament? Let me give you scripture tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 4 through 6, the King James Version says this, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought 
to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience in is fulfilled. Then I want you to know that it's important tonight for you to study for yourself. Acts 17, 11 through 13, King James Version. And these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether these things were so. Therefore many of them believed, also an honorable women which were Greeks, and of men not a few. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul of Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. What we need to know tonight is who's stirring you and keeping you from learning the word of the living God. You should know 2 Timothy 2.15-17, through 17, King James Version, Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needed not to be alarmed or ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as does a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philotes. So tonight I want you to know who is in your pulpit. And you need to understand what are they bringing you to increase in knowledge with the word of the living God. Here we find in the book of Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 through 21. I need you to hear me tonight. The Bible says first of all in Matthew 7 and 13 that it is a narrow way. Mm -hmm. Are you hearing me tonight? Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Beware, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Did you hear that? There are few who find it. That means tonight that you need to be on your job knowing what the word of God is saying and what he's saying to you, your house, and your life. The Bible said this, you will know them by their fruits. So he said in Matthew 7 and 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep clothing, mm. but inwardly they are ravishing wolves. Yes, yes. You will know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, yes. but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and is thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. It is important for you to understand who's ministering to you and what are they producing by the ministry from their words and not the word of the living God. The Bible said Jesus has something to say to these false prophets, these false teachers, these false apostles, these false evangelists. He said, I never knew you. This is found in Matthew 7 and 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, said Jesus, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So tonight you need to know 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. It is important for you to understand. And from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scriptures is given by inspiration of God 
and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so I need you to understand tonight that many, many people around the world are being deceived because they are not involved in the word of the living God. And so tonight, you need to understand what evidence is there of a spiritual realm. For you see, we live in the physical realm, but on the other side is the spiritual realm. And you need to understand that that is the realm where God dwells and where Satan is involved in deceiving mankind. Listen to me tonight. It is important for you to understand that the Bible teaches the existence of the immaterial spiritual reality unseen by human eyes. The physical reality is evident for all to see. You look out of your window, you see the sky, you see the heavens, you see the stars, you see the sun, you see the moon. Although some doubt the existence of the material universe too. The Bible says that the spiritual realm consists of both good for God and the holy angels and evil, the devil and his demons. And this is why tonight you need to know the word of God for yourself. Demons are more likely fallen angels who rebelled against God and were thrown out of heaven. See the book of Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 11 through 17, the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, verses 12 through 15, and the New Testament, Revelations 12, 7 through 9. Hear me tonight. It is important for you to understand the Bible also teaches that humans were created by God and in his image, which means we have a spiritual component, Genesis 1 and 27. We are more than physical entities. We possess a soul and a spirit destined for eternity. The problem is which one will you be involved and live in? Even though the spiritual realm is invisible to the physical eye, we are connected to it. And what goes on in the spiritual realm directly affects our physical world. That's why you need to know the word of God for yourself. In our culture, the most commonly accepted form of evidence for proving the existence of something is euphorial evidence, which involves using scientific methods of observation and experimentation. Is there ethereal evidence for a spiritual realm? It doesn't take much research before one realizes that there is a great deal of evidence both for and against the existence of the spiritual realm. It comes down to which studies one want to believe. Tonight I want you to know that there is a spiritual realm. God dwells in the third heaven and it is in the spiritual realm. Satan walks to and fro up on this earth and it is in the spiritual realm. The best and most prevalent evidence available proven that there is a spiritual realm is testimonial evidence. We can look at the sheer number of religions around the world and the billions of people who focus their lives on the spiritual realm. It is likely that so many people should report encounters with the spiritual and it is not real. Therefore, we know tonight that it is very real. The best testimonial evidence for a spiritual realm is the Bible itself, mm. which is why I'm telling you, you need to know it from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. The Bible itself, historians, both Christians and non-Christians agree that the historical authenticity of the Bible is very strong. Jesus claimed to be God's son, the one who came down from the third heaven. He made this fact very clear. You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. He said this in John 8 and 23. So the Bible 
recounts numerous encounters that people had with the spiritual realm. Jesus cast out demons out of people regularly, healed the sick by speaking to them, miraculously fed 5,000 people, and spoke with people who should be dead, Moses and Elijah, on the Mount of Transfiguration. All of these indicators are that the, the spiritual realm is very real. And that's why you need to know tonight how to encounter and to move forward with the weapons of your warfare in this spiritual realm. So tonight, I need to ask you the question, what does it mean to take every thought captive? Found in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. The answer, in speaking of our spiritual warfare, the Apostle Paul says that we take every thought captive and subject all thinking to Christ Jesus. Here are the Apostle Paul, and this is what he wrote. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. This is found in 2 Corinthians 10 and 5. Hear me tonight because this is important. The enemy does not want you to have an ear. But the Bible says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10 and 17. So tonight, the primary point of this section in 2 Corinthians is that we are in a spiritual warfare. Mm. That's why I read to you the full armor of God in the book of Ephesians. So tonight, I want you to understand what leads up to the statement that we take every thought captive is important. In verse 3, Paul states that though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. That is, we do not rely on human ingenuity or man-made plans to bring us victory. The flesh, hear me tonight, is powerless against the wiles of the devil. In verse 4, Paul mentioned the strongholds or the fortresses that are destroying by God's holy power. These strongholds are the philosophies, arguments, and proud opinions of others as found in verse number five. Listen to me tonight. Without question, there are many human thoughts that need to be taken captive. I'm sure you know of many of your own. Numerous ungodly philosophies holding people in bondage. Mm -hmm. And these spiritual fortresses need to be demolished. Yes, 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 yes. The system of thought that wars against us or arrogant obstacles, lofty opinions, and sophisticated arguments, and every exalted thing that pride brings in our lives. There we find that prevent people from knowing God. In our day, these systems of human thoughts include the theory of evolution. You know what that is, that man came from an amoeba and developed into thousands of years into a monkey, and from a monkey to an ape, and from an ape to a human being. God forbid that you believe that, un <laughs> glory to God, wisdom found by a crazy man named Darwin. Listen to me tonight. To prevent people from knowing God, we have to understand the word of God so that you will know the eternal God that made us in his own image. Mm. In our day, these systems of human thoughts are very prevalent, and you must know the difference between man's system and God's holy word. How can people be held captive by the idea that they are the product of of a chance, are you hearing me, in the godless universe. How? Because the enemy is blinding them and they refuse to require knowledge of the word of the living God. How many spiritual prisoners labor under the requirements of Allah and await freedom in Christ? We must take captive every thought that makes it obedient to Christ. If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed, according to John 8 and 36. Tonight, 
we understand false religion and secular philosophy have created thinking that has imprisoned the minds of millions in the earth today. It is a true spiritual battle. The God of this age, Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the very image of the Father, God. 2 Corinthians 4 and 4. Any idea, opinion, or worldwide that asserts that Christ is unnecessary is reflective of the devil's pride. Such thoughts must be taken captive and made obedient to Christ. Those who know the truth must confront error, oh my God, with the weapons we've been given, which I read to you tonight. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, found in Ephesians 6 and 17. Hear me tonight. Our weapons in a spiritual battle are not carnal, but mighty through God. As we are transformed by the reviewing of our mind and renewing of our mind, Romans 12 and 2, we engage the battle against pretense and arrogant philosophy in this world. Trusting our Christ and rightly dividing the word of God which I read to you tonight from 2 Timothy 2.15. We take every thought captive, pull down the strongholds, and by the grace of God, we set the captives free, both you and I. It is important tonight that you understand that deception is not just in the world, but deception is in our pulpits. And that's why it is important for you to know who is preaching in your pulpit. And what can I do when I'm under spiritual attack? Listen to me tonight. It is important for you to know that God has given us defensive weapons that we are to put on to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. The first thing to do when we believe we may be under a spiritual attack is to determine as best we can, whether we are experiencing and expecting is truly a spiritual attack from demonic forces or simply the effect of living in a sin-cursed world. Some people blame every sin, every conflict, and every problem on demons they believe need to be cast out. The Apostle Paul instructs Christians to wage war against the sin, first of all, in themselves, Romans chapter 6, and to wage war against the evil one, that's the devil, Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. But whether we are truly under spiritual attack from demonic forces or just battling the evil in ourselves and that which inhabits the world, the battle plan is the same. Stay with the word of the living God as found in all 66 books. Don't go to another book, but stay with the book of books that bring life, joy, and peace. Hear me tonight. The key to the battle plan, again, is found in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 10 through 18, which I read to you in the beginning. Here, Paul begins by saying that we must be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, not in your own power, which is no match for the devil and his demons. Paul then exhorts us to put on the whole armor of God, which is the only way to take a stand against spiritual attacks. In our own strength and power, we have no chance of defeating the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm, found in Ephesians 6. And 12. Only, only, only the full armor of God will equip us to withstand spiritual attack. Let me say that again. I don't want you to miss it. Only the full armor of God will equip us to withstand spiritual attack. We can only be strong in the Lord's power 
It is God's armor that protects us and our battle is against spiritual forces of evil in this world. Surely you know the darkness that prevails in the world today. From the book of Ephesians chapter 6, 13 through 18, it gives us a description of our spiritual armor that God has given us to wear. And the good news is that these things are really available, readily available to all who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to stand firm with the belt of truth buckled on the breastplate of righteousness. Wear on our feet the gospel of peace. Hold up the shield of faith. Wear the helmet of salvation and shield of the spirit, which is the word of God. The only offensive weapon in the whole armory the rest is defensive. What do these pieces of spiritual armor represent in spiritual warfare? We are to speak the truth against Satan lies, and he's lying right in the pulpit with false prophets and prophetess. You need to understand when you hear a lie, you know it immediately. Why? Because you know the difference in God's word. Hear me tonight. We are involved and we are under attack. That's why you need to know deception in the pulpit and what it means for you to hear a word that is not represented in the word of God. Hear me tonight. What do these pieces of spiritual armor represent in spiritual warfare? We are to speak the truth again against Satan lies. We are to rest in the fact that we are declared righteous because of Christ's sacrifice for us. What was that sacrifice, L.A., that he came down through 40 and two generations, died on a cruel Roman cross, shedded his blood that you and I might be brought back into divine relationship to the Father's house? We are to proclaim the gospel no matter how much resistance we receive. And you and I both know people are resisting the gospel of good news. They want to hear philosophy. They want to hear philosophical things. But I come by tonight to tell you, you better get back to the word of the living God. Hallelujah tonight. Our ultimate defense is the assurance we have of our salvation an assurance that no spiritual force can take away. Our offensive weapon is the word of God, not to our own opinion and not our feelings. Finally, we are to follow Jesus' example in recognizing that some spiritual victories are only possible through prayer. Mm -hmm. And you need to understand that you need to be a praying person. Jesus is our ultimate example when it comes to waiting and warring off spiritual attacks. Observe how Jesus handled direct attacks from Satan when he was tempted by him in the wilderness. This is found in Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Each temptation was answered the same way with the words, it is written, and a quote from the scriptures. Jesus knew the word of the living God is the most important weapon against the temptations of the devil. If Jesus himself used the word to counter the devil, do we dare to use anything less? That's why it is important for you to understand and know the word of God and how to find the scriptures of life that will bring you in the battle and bring you victory in this life. Hear me tonight. The ultimate example of how not to engage in spiritual warfare is the seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish priest who went around driving out evil spirits by trying to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. One day the evil spirits answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Ooh. Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. This is found in the book of Acts, chapter 19, verses 13 through 16. I advise you to read it and understand that if you're going to cast out the devil, the devil cannot be in you. 
The seven sons of Sceva was using Jesus' name. But because they did not have a relationship mm -hmm. with Jesus, their words were void of any power or any authority. They were not relying on Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They were not employing the word of God in their spiritual warfare. And as a result, they received a humiliating beating. May we learn from their bad example and conduct spiritual warfare as the Holy Bible instructs. That's why you and I need to know what deception really is all about. So that you will not be deceived and found naked without the word of the living God. So tonight, what does the Bible say about self-deception? That means you're deceiving yourself. Hallelujah. As we live in a world full of lies and deceit comes from many sources, there are lying spirits who lead astray, according to 1 Timothy 4 and 1. Let me say that again. You need to hear me. I said there are lying spirits who lead astray, 1 Timothy 4 and 1. There are evildoers and imposters looking to dupe you. 2 Timothy 3 and 13. And perhaps most insidious, we have ourselves to deal with. Self-deception is common in our fallen world. And that's why, again, you need to know the word of God for yourself. Our own hearts are deceitful. So much so that we easily fool ourselves. According to Jeremiah 17 and 9. Isaiah 44 and 20 speaks of an idolater who is misled by his own deluded heart. The prophet Obadiah identifies arrogance as one of the roots of self-deception. The pride of your heart has deceived you, Obadiah 1 and 3. Human pride always blinds us to the truth. It promises honor, but it delivers disgrace. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16 and 18. Hear me tonight as we go to the New Testament, the book of James, chapter 1, verse 22, warns us against deceiving ourselves. Do not merely listen to the word so to deceive yourselves. Do what it says. The self-deception that James had in mind <coughs> relates to an inappropriate response to truth. God's word is meant to change our lives. Amen. See Psalms 119 verse 11 and John 17, 17. We can sit in church for years in the front pew, listening to sermon after sermon, but it will never allow the word of God we hear preach change us then we are self-deceived. We can read the Bible from cover to cover, but unless we put its commands into practice, we deceive ourselves. Do you understand where I'm going tonight? Self-deception is common among religious people who accumulate truth in their minds, assuming that this is what true religion is all about. But Scripture was not given merely to produce theologians. It was given that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3.17 Holding the truth in one's mind is not necessarily a character-changing quality. Are you hearing me tonight? James chapter 1, 23-24 illustrates merely looking at oneself in a mirror is not necessarily an appearance-changing experience. God help us tonight. Mm. The mirror can tell us our hair is a mess, but unless we get out the brush and attack the problem, the tangles of the hair will remain. All right, now. Jane goes on to contrast self-deceived, worthless religion with pure and faultless religion, giving a practical example of each. One type of self-deception is to believe that our words do not matter. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongue deceive themselves, and their religion 
is worthless. James 1 and 26. In contrast tonight, those who successfully avoid being self-deceived practice true religion. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after the orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by this world. Verse number 27. Empty religion allows a person to employ the body members and their material resources toward self center objectives. But God approves of faith expressing itself through love. Galatians 5 and 6. Tonight, I need you to understand, self-deception is illustrated tragically by Samson. You know that story. This mighty hero of Israel disclosed the secret of his strength to Delilah, who betrayed him to his enemies while he slept. Once his hair had been cut, Delilah called Samson, the Philistines are up on you. Samson awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But oh my God, he did not know that the Lord had left him. Judges 16 and 20. Samson learned the hard way mm -hmm. that forgetting the word of God is a form of self-deception. And remember, the spirit of Delilah is with us today, is to wear you out and force you from moving in the things of God. Are you willing now to move back into the word of the living God? The bravo of the giant Goliath is another example of self-deception. He strutted and boasted and flung insects at, at Israel. Surely that his great size and physical strength would ensure victory against the much smaller and weaker David. But he was wrong. <laughs> because David had God on his side. In fact, Goliath didn't even know what battle he was really fighting. His fight was not with David, but with David's God, the eternal God of heaven and earth, found in 1 Samuel 17, 41 through 51. And I advise you to read that for yourself. You need to understand that you need to know that you are not fighting this battle on your own. Mm. But this battle is being fought with the word of the living God. Therefore, self-deception can occur in relation to one security, as shown in Jesus' parable of the rich fool. Mm. The man in the story was thrilled that his land produced an unusual abundant crop. He believed that he'd come to a time, are you hearing me, in his life when he would and could take life easy, drink and be merry, Luke 12, 19. But this was wishful thinking, for he would die that very night. Mm. This night, you fool, your soul is required of you. The church of Laodicea was the victim of self-deception concerning their spiritual condition in the book of Revelation. This lukewarm church had convinced itself that everything was all right. He said, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need anything. This is found in the book of Revelations, chapter 3, verse 17. But Jesus, who always speak the truth and is the truth, set them straight. He said, you do not realize that you are rich, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. This is found in Revelations and the same book, chapter 3, verse 17. So tonight, hear me. To avoid spiritual deception, we must be like the one who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continue to do it. Not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it. They will be blessed in what they do. James 1 and 25. Hear me tonight, remembering the word doing the word and continuing in the word. Mm. This is what changes character and counters self-deception. Like a mirror, the word of God will always show you the truth. You remember the story of Cinderella and the wicked queen? She looked into the mirror and said, mirror, mirror on the wall, 
who is the fairest of them all, and the mirror told the truth. Cinderella, and don't you forget it. When you look in the mirror, you see the truth. The real you is revealed. And if the word of God prevails in your life, the real you will shine. If the word of God is not prevailing in your life, darkness will be shown. And so I need you to understand tonight that God has given us weapons of our warfare. And they're not carnal. They're not fleshly. And you need to grab a hold of them and do warfare against the enemy, Satan, his demons, and this world. This is found again in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 through 4, Paul touches on spiritual warfare, and we are in a war, and we are in warfare. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. The word carnal here refers to physical weapons that are fleshly or human in nature. Here the Apostle Paul, he said, having concluded his discussion on the duty of charitable living in 2 Corinthians uh, 9, now presents a defense of himself against the accusations leveled by his opponents, the Jews who did not want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. We find now, and I need you to hear me, his primary objective is to defend his apostolic authority and demonstrate that like the other apostles, he has a rightful claim to be an apostle in the apostolic office. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 11, Galatians 2, 7 through 10. In the defense span, 2 Corinthians 10 through 12, and chapter 10, however, the focus point of Paul's argument is that he did not rely on eternal factors to endorse himself. No carnal weapons, verse number 4. No superficial facade and no human wisdom or oratorical existence of excellence. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. What did he depend on? The word of the living God. There were false teachers within the Corinthian church who rejected Paul's apostolic authority. And there are false teachers in your church who will object to you because you know the truth. These teachers boasted about their natural talents and their achievements. The weapons of their warfare were carnal or fleshly. The precise nature of their accusations against Paul is uncertain, but we can be inferred from the epistle itself that they were against the truth, as so many are today. In 2 Corinthians 10 and 1, it appears that false teachers primarily contention involved around Paul perceived inconsistency. They claim that Paul, are you hearing me, was bold when writing to them but he lacked the courage to follow through on his threats of disciplinary action. In other words, he was all bark and no bite. In response to this, Paul offered the following rebuttal. This is what he said. First, he appeared to the meekness and gentleness of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 1 and 2. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. In doing so, Paul skillfully defends his own gentleness against their criticism. He implores them, however, to refrain from giving him a reason to demonstrate the boldness that he has proposed. Paul had no desire to exhibit boldness and severity when administering discipline, as stated in 2 Corinthians 10, 1 and 2. Second, Paul assumes the church that the weapons of his warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, found in verse 4. In other words, the weapons that Paul used were spiritual, not physical, and not fleshly. Carnal weapons such as manipulation and deceit will not succeed against spiritual enemies. For this reason, Paul appeared to the strength of God which demolish strongholds and anything that stands in opposition to the truth 
of God's word. This is why I know when you stand on the solid rock, you cannot be defeated. Hear me tonight. That's why it is important for you to know God's word from Genesis to Malachi, from Matthew to Revelation. So you asked the question tonight, what is a stronghold? I'm glad you asked. A stronghold is anything on which one relies. The false teachers in Corinth relied on human reasoning and argumentation to attack Paul and fortify their position against him. But Paul have none of this. Instead, relying on similar tactics, Paul took up the whole armor of God found in Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. And I advise you to do the same. Put on the whole armor of God that you may quench the fiery darts of the wicked and especially satanic attacks. Listen to me, false teachers, reliance on carnal weapons caused them to manipulate and to deceive. That's why we have preachers today in the pulpit that are not anointed nor called of God. And what they're telling you will not help you spiritually, but cause you to fall down spiritually. But Paul equipped himself with the belt of truth, which is what you and I must wear on every occasion. They fought with sinfulness of heart and mind. But Paul put on the breastplate of righteousness to protect his heart with the word of the living God. They fought with eloquent words. But Paul walked in the shoes of the gospel, death, burial, resurrection, and soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. These evil men fought with human strength and wisdom, but the apostle Paul defended himself with the shield of faith. They fought with human authority, but Paul had the helmet of salvation. They fought with demonic schemes and strategies, but Paul wielded the sword of the Spirit, which is the mighty word of the living God. Tonight, I want you to understand, Christ relies on spiritual, not carnal weapons, Amen. when he fought against his enemies. Philippians 2, 6 through 8. After Peter struck the servant of the high priest on his ear, Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. That's physical weapons. You need spiritual weapons given by the word of God. So do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? Matthew 26, 51 through 53. The false teachers at Corinth who were carnal minded would have viewed Jesus as weak and feeble. However, Jesus demonstrated that the best way to fight against our enemies is to humble ourselves and to allow the power of God to work and work through us. And so tonight I want you to know that it is important for you to understand it's now time, high time, that we get back to the word of the living God. So tonight I want you to understand what does pulling down strongholds mean in 2 Corinthians 10 and 4. You need to know that tonight so that you will not be deceived and cause yourself ruin while not understanding the word of the living God. False teachers were wrecking havoc on the church in Paul's day and Paul found them in the church in Corinth. These deceivers were stirring up division causing many to resist Paul's authority found in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul challenged these rebels, including the false teachers, and reinforced his apostolic ministry. As a part of his defense, Paul stated this, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, 2 Corinthians 10 and 4. In this context, pulling down strongholds refer to demolishing Walls of resistance in people's minds, Hallelujah. particularly how the rebellious Corinthians were thinking yeah. about Paul and the Thank nature you. of his apostleship. I don't know about you, but that's what we need to do in church today. Yeah. Destroy the mindset 
of the wicked and bring them to the point of repentance. Bring them to the point of being forgiven and set free by the word of God. Did you understand tonight that Paul realized that the battle he faced in Corinth was spiritual warfare? Yes. He was not fighting against people, but he was fighting against demons and Satan himself. Mm -hmm. He had founded the church in Corinth and the humility and gentleness of Christ. According to 2 Corinthians 10 and 1, he had not lorded over the people, mm -hmm. not trying to impress them with overpowering personalities or oratorical flair. Instead, the apostle had operated in Christ-like meekness, according to Matthew 11 and 29. His power rested in the gospel that he preached, Romans 1, 16, and not in himself. This is why you must know the truth when you hear it, and the truth will set you free. Mm. Paul defended and depended on spiritual weapons of warfare that held God's power to pull down strongholds. He did not rely on human strategy and wisdom, but on the power by the Lord himself. Paul knew his struggles were not against flesh and blood. Mm. Are you hearing me? But enemies, but against the power of this dark world mm. and spiritual forces of evil, according to Ephesians 6 and 12. I need you to hear me tonight because this is important. What Paul did is what we need to do tonight. Because of Paul's humble attitude, yes. the false teachers judged him by his eternal presence, finding him timid and unimpressive. 2 Corinthians 10 and 1 and verse 10. They completely missed the divine power that endowed his ministry. They evaluated Paul's ministry according to the flesh. 2 Corinthians 10 and 3, and not according to the Spirit of God. And many people today are evaluating you because you are not agreeing with them in the flesh, but you are moving in the power of God. Can I ask you to stay firm and stand firm on the solid rock? Don't come down. Remember what Nehemiah said, we cannot come down to you. We're on this wall yeah. and we're going to continue until the wall is built. Yeah. Hear me today. You need to understand this. Jericho walls are like the walls of resistance in the minds of rebellious people, and they must be torn down. When God's people in Joshua day by faith followed the word of God and obeyed his command, the walls of Jericho fell down flat. Joshua 6, 1 through 27. The battle was the Lord's, fought his way, and according to his instructions. Humbly speaking, the whole episode seems absurd. People marching around walls six days and on the seventh day, seven times. Oh, that looks so foolish. The walls are impregnable. They will not fall down. But what they didn't realize was that these Israelites were following the word mm -hmm. of God. And they fought it his oh. way and according to his instructions. So, humanly speaking, the whole episode again seemed what? Out of order. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Found in 1 Corinthians 1, 27. The massive walls of Jericho collapsed in an instant by the mighty hand of God in the same way through faithful obedience to God's command, every saint of God will pull down all spiritual strongholds, pulling down and letting it go so that you can have power in the word of the living God. Thoughts contrary to the truth of God's word are like a mental wall of resistance. Let me say that again. I don't want you to miss it. Thoughts contrary to the truth of God's word like a mental wall of resistance, a stronghold. The Apostle Paul faced this stronghold in the Corinthian church. Pride and intellectualism had exalted their thinking and blinded them to the real truth, mm -hmm. the message of the cross of Calvary and the Lord Jesus Christ being the perfect Lamb of God on that cross had become foolishness to these spiritual rebels. But Paul knew 
that it held the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 18. The believer's approach, yours and mine, to pulling down strongholds is to present the truth of God's word and let the Holy Spirit reshape the other person's thoughts, their hearts, attitudes, and perceptions. You stay with the word of the living God. You don't have anything to prove intellectually or academically. The only thing you need to know is the word of God will find itself in a place of strength to move the devil out. Paul, gentle, humble attitude, established a powerful spiritual weapon against the pride of human stance of his opponents. Pride, scripture reveals, is Satan's predominant attitude and primary pitfall. That's how he fell with pride, fell from a lofty position of being a cerebrum in the heavens and fell to the earth. Now you and I have to contend with the devil, but I want you to know the Bible says if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. God opposes the pride and favors the meek. Let me say that again. God opposes opposes the pride and favors the meek, according to James 4, 6 through 7, 1 Peter 5, 5 through 6. The Lord rescues the humble, but brings down the haughty. Haven't you seen this in your life, how people who once thought they had it all now end up with nothing because they don't allow the Spirit of God to have the right of way? The Bible names several weapons for pulling down strongholds and waging spiritual warfare. They include the word of God. They include prayer and demonstrates of love and humility, the full armor of God, the power of God's spirit working in our lives. But the key, as Paul demonstrates to the Corinthians, is relying on God's divine power and not your own. Mm -hmm. I need you to understand tonight as we get ready to close part one, and get ready next week for part two. You have the weapons of warfare that God has given us that is recorded in the book of Ephesians. And you need to put on the whole armor of God to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, when you see the wolf in the pulpit, I need you to understand the wolf sees the sheep only in one way. That is to eat them for dinner. So you need to understand that when you encounter false prophets, false apostles, false evangelists, false pastors and teachers, you need to run in the other direction and find the church that has established itself on the word of the living God. You need to understand tonight that deception is in the land and it will be here until Jesus comes back. And you need to know who is in your pulpit, who is teaching you the truth as found in the word of God, and who is bringing you down to the pits of hell. You need to know for yourself. And so tonight, as I close this message, I'm asking, I'm imploring, I'm strongly asking you to get back into the word of the living God. Study it for yourself. Know it in your mind and receive it in your heart and believe it. Stand firm and hold on to it because deception is in the land. So tonight, as we pray, I pray the word of God, the revelation of the word of God, the inspiration of the word of God will find you in your heart and a transformed mind to receive and know that the word of God is what will keep us in perfect peace if our minds are stayed on him. So Father, in the precious name of Jesus, tonight we come as humble as we know how, pleading the blood of Jesus over our lives and asking you through the power of the Holy Spirit to equip us in the word of the living God to fight the good fight of faith and to know when and how to move away from deception and those who are false leaders, 
false teachers, false preachers who are teaching the devil's doctrine, but not the word of God. Yeah. Help us Help, Lord. to follow the power and the anointing of God's word that destroys yokes yeah. and bring us into a place where we stand firmly on the solid rock, yeah. which is the Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Teach us from Genesis to Malachi. Teach us from Matthew to Revelation, yeah. the 66 books of power to lead us into the directions of the word of God and find us in a relationship, find us in fellowship, find us in kinship with the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit and we'll give you glory yeah. and we'll give you praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, Amen. this is Apostle L.A. Anderson telling you tonight the truth will set you free. And on behalf of Prayer Changes Things Ministry and Pastor Lois Antoine and myself, go with God. Amen. 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 You're back in the hands of Pastor Lois.